there. I'm Sarah Clark, the pastor here at UMCE, and I would like to welcome you to church today. Please let us know that you are participating in worship by filling out our online worship attendance form. You can find a link to it along with this video. I invite you to create sacred space for yourself to spend time with God and with the community that is gathered. Light a candle or open a window or pour a cup of coffee, anything that will help this time feel set apart as we worship God together. As we bring our whole selves to worship today, let us pray. Loving God, you speak to us through scripture and then the collective wisdom of your people throughout the ages. We give thanks for your word, a message of life and hope that hums and reverberates in our lives and in your word. Help us to hear anew what you would say to us today. Amen. I'm glad that you're with us for worship today. Welcome to church. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin and not molest, near to the heart of God, oh Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 
this week, I am actually away. I'm recording this early, and we have a guest preacher bringing us the message today, and it's kind of a special one for me because our guest preacher is actually my dad, a Reverend Dale Beck. Uh, I'm so grateful to have him filling in today um, and for the chance to share with you um, his message um, this morning. So our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern. He is Jesus. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to online worship at United Methodist Church of Evergreen. I'm Reverend Dale Beck uh, here with you today while your pastor, Sarah Clark, is recovering from surgery early this week. Uh, she is doing very well. I bring greetings from the United Methodist Church of Estes Park, where I worship in retirement. Um, I uh, was a pastor for over 30 years in uh, serving in Illinois. And since retirement and moving to Estes Park, I've, I've served the, uh, the Mountain Sky Conference uh, at five different churches as interims, um, including uh, at Hope United Methodist Church in Greenwood Village, where I worshiped with Stephanie Price, who was your intern at one time and, uh, and, and an associate. Um, I do usually do what Sarah tells me because I am her father, and uh, she um, asked me to be with you today. Shall we pray? Now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We're talking about storms today, and storms in Scripture are always about more than weather. Storms in life, they challenge our faith, they sometimes send us back to faith again. Storms unmask our insufficiencies. They also form the shape and textures of our life together, the way we live and the way we love. In the poetry of Scripture, storms represent chaos, disruption, disaster, disease. Storms threaten our contentment and our routine, sometimes our even existence. And we can't escape storms. The uncontrollable and irresistible forms of disorder are part of our humanness and frailty. We find ourselves always struggling to overcome now, storms come in very individual ways, like the chaos of a diagnosis or a tragic accident, and also in public ways. Uh, we've experienced in the last year those called pandemic and wildfire. The chaos of migration is a part of our world today, but it was very much a part of Jewish memory and scripture. Uh, millions of people today now caught in that chaos of migration in Europe, in Africa, South America, and Middle East, even in the U.S. Now, the great Old Testament scholar Walter Bergman says that the Bible is a lot more interested in chaos than it is in sin and guilt. Now, sin and guilt has preoccupied Protestant theology, but, but for the long sweep of things, 
chaos has actually been more what what the Bible talks about. One of the one of the most interesting t- treatments of chaos for me in the Hebrew scriptures is in the book of Job. I like it because Job is really arguing against the usual ways of thinking about chaos. Job, of course, faces chaos in some enormous soul-shattering scale. His wife, after he, he's, he's uh, covered with boils uh, and before all his children die, he says, why don't you just curse God and die? But Job holds on to his faith. His, his friends come and, and to comfort him, uh, and they hold this worldview that's part of the traditional teaching from the Deuteronomic Code. It says, if you do well, everything will be well with you. When bad things happen to Job, they just, these friends just understood that Job must have done something terrible to offend God. And that wasn't the case. The friends came comforting, but there was no comfort in the the code that says that if you do bad, bad things will happen to you. There's no comfort, only harassment for him. They say to Job, you must have done something terrible. Think harder. You'll come up with it. Maybe it was pride. Job says no. Maybe you thought too high of yourself. Maybe you weren't sufficiently grateful for everything that was going well. Just over and over, trying out the different things that he could have done wrong. This book spends a lot of time on their speeches, but it's really arguing that that explanation about chaos is lacking. And Job asks a question, more like the one that the disciples ask in our story about the storm and the boat. Remember, the storm is raging, the boat is about to be swamped, and Jesus is asleep in the stern. Remember, it's from the stern that the boat is guided. He's sitting on the cushion that should have been occupied by the helmsman who had controlled the boat. They're saying, we can't do anything about it. We're we're about to be overthrown. So the story, you see, is really indeed about God and chaos and God's role in our survival. And the disciples wake Jesus asking, the great existential question, which is also the question of Job. They say, do you not care that we are about to die? Do you not care, they ask Jesus? Do you not care that we're about to perish? Does God care? When Mark wrote the book, it was, that was a fundamental question for people who followed Jesus, and because they followed Jesus, were cast out of the synagogue, maybe imprisoned as Peter and Paul had been. Do you care, Jesus, that we are perishing, that the storms are very fierce, and the cost of following is very steep? It's a fundamental question for people who would be peacemakers or or who would have a sense that loving God and neighbor truly is the great work of Christianity and probably is the universal thread that passes through our great spiritual traditions. For us to be able to love others, the very groundwork for that humanizing principle is for a person to know love. Father Richard Rohr calls it the essential precedent to our being able to love. The work of loving others is a harsh discipline or a Herculean task until we have accepted and believed and thoroughly taken it into our hearts and our being that we are accepted, that God loves us, God delights in us, God longs for us and suffers for us and agonizes over our well-being and deeply agonizes over our hearing and sensing deeply that God's love for us has been forever and always. God does not love us when we become baptized. We become baptized to affirm and celebrate that God has always loved us. Mark has much more to say on the subject of Jesus and love and discipleship, but it begins with the simple affirmation when the waking Jesus addresses the storm and says, peace, be still, and the storm was calmed. The disciples go away asking, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? 
Well, there is much more for them to learn about God's love. They know, they learn that God cares. Even the hairs of our head are all counted. Sparrows are sold for two pennies in the market and sparrows fall, but not without God's notice. God cares. The way God cares will be shown when Jesus feeds the hungry crowd, touches the leper, restores life to the widow's son, weeps over Jerusalem, cleanses the temple, prays in the garden, gives them bread, says, this is my body broken for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins and dies on a cross. Ancient and modern readers will learn that the one who rules the winds and waves does not rule by moral compulsion, but by moral suasion, does not wish for followers who act as puppets without will of their own, but as fully alive people with hearts that are like to God's own heart. And they will grow into this life and this depth of love built on the foundation of an assurance that God cares. God cares for our lives. God has accepted us and befriended us and accompanies us through the storms of life, that like the trauma and chaos that give shape and contour of the mountains, the storms of our lives will shape and form us, but not destroy us, as disasters in Job's life formed him. When God visited Job and spoke to him, what he says is, gird yourself up like a man and stand and listen. Basically. He says, as Jesus says to the storm, be still and know that I am. I experienced some personal chaos a, a half dozen years ago or so on a backpacking trip with my wife's brother in the Utah Canyon where I encountered slick rock. Now, those are these huge vertical rock faces in the canyon. I hadn't cross those before, especially not with a 40-pound pack. I, I stepped out on it, and I felt like I was losing my balance. I had to walk across, and, and I was being off balance. I, uh, I took a quick step to, to get, get to a better place, and more steps and more steps, and I just was always off balance. Pretty soon, I was not only panicking, but I was also out of breath. Once I ducked down and I became aware that I was more like a ball and I could roll down the thing easily. Uh, it, was, it was a mess and I was, I was in trouble. I knew the last day of the hike would have more and worse of, of those to pass. And I turned to my Buddhist brother-in-law for advice. He said to me that when you step out and you feel out of balance, Instead of taking another quick step, be still. He says, don't move until you get centered. Be still. Sense the firm ground beneath you. Wait until you have your balance there. Then take a step and get your balance. And wait until you have that balance again and you, you are firm again. And then move. Be still. Seek confidence and balance in which the true and firm holds you up, then step out. It's the way to walk through chaos. Jesus cares, God cares, spirit cares. Be still and know. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is holy. Be still, O oh restless soul of mine, bow before the Prince of Peace. Let the noise and clamor cease. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know he is our Father. Come rest your head upon his breast. Listen to the rhythm of his unfailing heart of love. Beating for his little ones, calling each of us to come. 
Be still and know that he is God. Be still. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Solid Rock.
I invite you to offer your gifts and your lives to God in this moment together, knowing that giving and generosity is a part of our faith, and it is a work of community to offer what we can from what we have, uh, knowing that God is bringing all of the gifts of our community together. Um, and so in this work of community and faith, we are invited to join. I want to let you know that we, we are updating the system that we use for, uh, for offering and for collecting um, your gifts in our office. So if you give through the mail by sending a check into the church, you can continue to do that the way you always have. You can send it to 3757 Ponderosa Drive uh, in Evergreen, Colorado, 80439. If you give online, you can still go to evergreenumc.org and click on donate in order to give. If you have set up a recurring donation, meaning that each week or each month or every two weeks, your gift um, is automatically given to the church, we uh, are asking that you update your um, recurring gift. You don't have to change it. You don't have to change the amount, but we are changing the system that we use to, um, to get those gifts. So if you will go back to our, um, you, and you'll find all of this in Happenings. If you go to our page, you can set up a recurring gift again. If you uh, have already set up that a recurring gift, we would ask that you change that over. And to do that, you need to cancel your the gift that, the way that you've been giving before through Vanco. You can find all of that information in the happenings email, or you can call the church office and Jessica can kind of talk you through that whole process. Also, we have a new feature where you can um, text the amount of your gift to uh, our to the church, and um, we can receive your gift that way. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, the number to uh, text the amount of your gift is seven two zero nine zero two nine five nine three. Thank you for your generosity and for your patience as we make this change in the office. It will make. Get it, uh, receiving your gifts and giving your gifts much easier and tracking your uh, the giving so that we can keep track of what you've given to the church this year. It will make it all much easier. So thank you for your patience and for your generosity. As we offer our gifts and ourselves to God, I would invite you to join me in saying aloud or in your heart this prayer of commitment. Loving God, faithful and gracious forever. You love us more than we love ourselves. You believe in us more than we believe in ourselves. You call us to walk with Christ and be more than we ever thought possible. Take our gifts, receive our thanks, accept our praise through Jesus Christ. Amen.
you for joining us today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you wherever it is you find yourself. Go to serve God and one another in all that you do. Go in peace. Amen.
Yeah.